fantastic experts and speakers sharing with us their tips. We have Diana, Heba, and Sylvia. So thank you everyone for coming and those that are uh, tuning in later. If you have any questions for our speakers, please do drop them into the chat and we'll be answering them afterwards. So today, as I mentioned, we've got three different speakers talking to us about three different aspects of online marketing. Sylvia Martin is kicking us off with Tech SEO Foundations, so how you can actually start uh, working in Tech SEO. Then we have Diana talking about how to build a social community. And Heba will share her case study around internal linking, why really it's important to do it and you cannot afford to actually miss out. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to pass over to our first speaker, Sylvie Martin, who will be talking to us about Tech SEO Foundations. Over to you, Sylvia. Hi, hello, thank you. So yeah, my name is Sylvia Martin, and uh, let's yeah, get it started. So I'm a trilingual SEO consultant. You might notice that in my accent, <laughs> I speak English, uh, French, and Spanish. And I've been always interested in tech SEO. So yeah, I, I, did, I have seven years of experience and I did work both um, agency side and in-house. And now I have my own consultancy. So yeah, I've always been interested in tech SEO. And, at the beginning, like everyone, you know, you do more general things. And then I started to specialize more on tech SEO. And when I was working at the agency here in London, I was doing more, yeah, like only technical SEO projects. So then, yeah, let's go to the talk. So what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to talk about the technical SEO foundations if the text appears at some point. <laughs> voilà. So yeah, what is tech SEO? How you can get uh, started learning tech SEO and the tech and technical SEO fundamentals and then how you can learn like through courses or like with some tips that you can go further. So let's start with what is technical SEO. So as you might know, SEO have like three main pillars. So we are going to focus more on the last one. So discoverability, credibility, indexability, and technology, technical SEO. Here you have uh, the um, definition of tech SEO, one of them, and is that it's all about the process, the technical process that um, you use to improve uh, organic visibility. So yeah, so how you can get a started learning. So first with the technical SEO fundamentals. So for me, these are the main things that you need to, to look and to understand. So understand how search works, websites work, master technical SEO concepts, and yeah, the main tools. You need to know how to use the main tools. And all of this is going to help you to identify and fix technical issues and improve organic performance. So let's continue with the understanding how search works. So this is a quick video that um, you can see later because due to the you know limited time, only 10 minutes, so we cannot show it here. But yeah, you have the link there and you can have a look is to understand, you know, the, like a beginner how search works. And then you have further resources here for you to understand, you know, what is scrolling, what is indexing, ranking, everything. So this is really important to master that, to understand it. And then if you're feeling more adventurous, you have this book that is uh, really good about information retrieval. Okay, another thing is understanding how websites work. So for this, yeah, you need to understand some basics, you know, like coding, HTML. For, uh, I will recommend to start with that, with HTML. You have like some tutorials online. This one of W3 schools is really good. So you can start with that just to identify, you know, what are the main elements of the page. Also, you need to know the web development basics. So you don't need to become a developer unless you want to, but at least you need to understand, you know, how the websites are done, how is the coding, how is um, how the, all the elements, how they work together, and understand technical language and communicate with developers. That's really important. 
and then you have here more resources so you can learn like these ones you know they have uh, courses about development and then what are the some of the basic concepts so yeah i have here a list for you to to have something to get started to learning so for example yeah you have blade regs canonicals uh, robux txt files mm, the different robux tags you know no index all of these things it's really important that you start uh, learning what it is for each of one how it affects seo performance and the different ways to fix it because you know this is the famous it depends <laughs> because there's so many different ways of fix the same issue and it will depend on many factors so yeah another thing yeah you need to learn how to use basic technical seo tools so search console you might use it already if you work in seo but for other reasons like for example for keyword rankings but for tech seo index coverage report is really important so you need to look at it to identify main technical issues here is a screenshot and you can see for example the green one is the valid and index pages and then you have the other excluded so it's interesting to know why and yeah the work starts there so here you have a resource you can check uh, videos if you're starting by zero with a search console and then this one is really great about um, all of this index coverage. So it's going to guide you like with the different things that you can identify. Another tool, crawlers. So there's many on the market. So you don't need to use them all, but you need to know, you know, how to crawl a website and to understand the reports and identify, identify issues. Yeah. So for example, if you are in a starting point, I would recommend the screen frog or a sidebar. So for example, Screaming Frog, um, they have a free version. I think it's limited to some URLs, but it's really good. And is that you can run a crawl and see what is there. You have, there's many tutorials online. So yeah, you have here some references that you can check or Sitebulb, the same here, a screenshot and some tutorials if you want to get started with it. And then a little more advanced is log file analyzers. This is challenging, but not only because it's more advanced, but also because it's really difficult to get hold on the log files. So sometimes the companies, they don't keep it for long or maybe they don't want to share it. So yeah, it's a bit challenging. And then once you master all of this, you can start identifying all the issues and the fun starts here. So yeah, you can look for you know, indexation issues, duplicated content. Maybe you have a website that have like two versions or three versions open with the WW or the HTTP, HTTPS, you know, different things, right? Direct chains, so many things. And this is the part that I like the most, doing the technical audits. So how you can learn in a more structured way, if you are interested. So you can do a course. For example, this one is a good starting point. It's only five hours, it's free. But I highly recommend this one with uh, Blue Array. It's SEO managed course. It's not really technical SEO, but I've done it last year and it's really great. And it also has um, in the curriculum a lot of technical SEO basics and explain really well the concepts. So yeah, it's really worth it, this one. And then how you can grow your technical skills in a different way. You can learn by doing. That's the best thing. So if I only can tell you on one thing, it will be this. You need to really go there and do things. So you can do this, like either having your own website and practicing or checking other websites. This is like the easiest way, but yeah, get experience. So to check uh, some websites, you have here the process is just, um, there's different ways you can use uh, Chrome Dev Tools and inspect elements and then you will see something like this like the behind the scenes of the um, website and then also you can check the code source the raw html that it will look like this so that's why it's really important to understand some basics of coding and programming to understand I and mean, identify the different elements and things that you need to change on the website it's really important to stay up to date so yeah, for example, uh, Google, they, has, they have this um, annual conference that is for developers, but the same, you know, for SEOs too, it's really important to, to check it out and, and know, you know, what, is the, what are the new things that they are presenting? Where is Google heading to? Official sources is really good, like this uh, Google search central blog, 
the same to to know what is new what they are doing google developers documentation this is like the bible this is really important to read it so you have here also the link and these different guidelines and they're important also whenever you're working on a project you need to come back to them and check it because also they change quite often so you need to be up to date also like from the latest things i use it also for like manual penalties and things like that so yeah quite handy attending uh, technical conferences uh, will help you you know to boost and improve your knowledge and there's also um, technical seo tracks from other conferences for example brighton seo and others they also have so yeah webinars they will help um also you know building up this experience and knowledge so this one is a really good one from sunraj and then other videos for example for specific topics this is about um, javascript seo and then if you want more resources you have here from the amazing aleida solis this is uh, there's a part on this uh, learning seo that is only about tech seo so yeah check it out you will need to look for some support it will help so if you are working on reading seo you can go to your peers or colleagues look for a mentor join communities or go to twitter and you know get the conversation started with other people i recommend to test your knowledge so you can do some quizzes like this one or gamification this is a fun game you know and they are do you have the url there and and yeah you can practice and learn and have fun another one is a little more advanced create your own roadmap so is that you need to commit to some time to learn and practice so i remember at the beginning i was my first year when i wanted to go more into the tech seo part i was committing like around seven hours extra hours um every week to learn so yeah that will help practice and practice again because you know is that if you want to get to this famous ten thousand hours that uh, makes you an expert you need to put the time in and then to finish just remember that learning technical seo is a process so you just need to master the next step go there little by little and then keep moving in the right direction thank you very much it was a pleasure Thank you very much, Sylvia, for your tech SEO tips. Um, I just had a question actually for you about your sort of getting into tech SEO. How long uh -huh. did it actually, um, probably what I would say, take you? Because I think a lot of this as well is about confidence. So you were an SEO, and then when did you say, okay, I want to move into tech SEO? Hmm. I think it will depend for each one. But for example, in my case, it took me one year. So after one year doing SEO and doing more technical, then I took the lead. And in my next job, I was doing like mostly tech SEO. So it depends, you know, on the hours that you spend doing it, right? And then little by little also you will improve. And do we have any other questions from the audience? Feel free to ask Sylvia from asking for her own experience. So I remember you also were working a client side, then you moved agency side. So just to confirm then when you made that leap to the agency side, you were doing pure tech SEO. And you got a lot of experience, I'd assume, because you worked across lots of brands. Yes. Yeah, no, it was really good. And also, yeah, I did more. And the good thing about agency is that you have the support of your colleagues. So it's really good for learning too. Yeah. Because it's not only your work, you can, you know, rely on others and see what others are doing. So yeah. Agency is always great for learning. So next we have one uh, question from Shibangi Gore. She says, uh, how do we analyze um, the server logs? You mentioned that uh, you don't always have lots of time from it uh, because you, the, the dev team may not always keep it so long. So how would you recommend, or is there a process that you would put in place for this? Yeah, so first, yeah, you need to get hold of them. That is a challenge per se, as I said. And then after there's different tools, it's the same as the crawlers. So they are log files um, analyzers. So the basic one, you have um, a screaming frog, they have one. So it's the same and you have tutorials also. I think in this slide, I put some tutorials there. So you can check those reference there, but also like big crawlers, 
like deep crawl and others, they also have a specific part with um, log files analyzers. So the same, you will need to use a specific tool. Yeah. Great. I'd also just to emphasize the fact of what you mentioned as well, that tech SEO is a big it's a big area to cover. I think a lot like SEO in general, it will take uh, a while, but this is something that is continuously developing. So it's okay if you're not, uh, if you don't know everything because you, know, you can't know everything. Uh, what sort of um, you know communities would you recommend to join or other Twitter type of events to join to, to learn more about tech SEO? Yeah, so Women in Tech SEO is really great. But yeah, it's only for women. But that's amazing because you have like lots of webinars, a lot of resources, Slack, a lot of things. But then I, I also mentioned uh, Traffic Think Tank. I think they have also like a channel on things for tech SEO. And then in Twitter, yeah, mainly start follow one, following like people that uh, works in technical. And then, you know, little by little, you will build up more knowledge and look what other people is sharing. Great, and you've also um, obviously shared the Blue Array course that you did that you said was yes. very thorough, and then mm -hmm. the Tech SEM, SEM Grime course with SEM Rush too. Yeah, and the thing is that is, it's a process, it will take the, take the time that it takes, but if you work on it also, you know, you're improving. Most of the times I was um, improving my knowledge because of the some projects that I had, because then it forces you to have your attention on that specific one, right? So it's good to be also flexible. And then the first time is more challenging and then you will know how to fix and how to do things better and better. And yeah, ask, ask other people also, always. Great, thank you. Yes, I would say that definitely um, I uh, sort of, I support what you said about the fact that I just ask other people, but really I'd also stress with everyone that's learning anything in SEO, it is an industry that's moving very quickly, so it's perfectly okay not to know everything, and it's perfectly okay, as you said as well, Sylvia, for asking questions. Thank you very much uh, for being on the show with us today. It was great for you to share knowledge with us. And how can people get hold of you, Sylvia? Yeah, so I have there my Twitter handle, so it's Sylvia SMP, or my LinkedIn if they want to, yeah. Okay, perfect. And, um, we will be, for everyone that's registered to the event, we will be sending around the slides and the link to this uh, video presentation to that. So thank you very much, Sylvia, for sharing thank everything you. with us today. And uh, I'm going to bring on our uh, interim slide um, while Diana prepares for her slides of her presentation to how to build a so -so social community interesting to see that using different budgets of course so i'm ready when you are okay i don't see your slides yet oh well i wasn't sharing just yet here <laughs> so uh diana richardson is talking to us about how to build a social community some of you uh may know her already working at SEM rush uh but she's also going to draw on her experience from working with uh, smaller brands as well so that um anyone can provided you follow some of the tips from China, you can actually build um, a great community as well. So I will pass over to you, Diana. Yeah, great, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, excellent. Yeah, so um, I wanted to talk to you guys today about building a community and, because that's what I do, that's what I love doing. And outside of my experience with SEMrush, I'm going to show you some examples from the other, some of the other businesses I've worked with throughout my career. I did not put an intro slide about myself, but I am Diana. I am the social media and community manager with the SEO unit at SEMrush. I am a part of the Women in Tech SEO group that Sylvia has been mentioning. Um, it's fabulous. That's kind of where Sylvia, Heba, and I um, all met each other. So it's a wonderful community of women-minded um, SEOs. Um, I've been a digital marketer since 2006. My background is in SEO, paid search, and social media, of course. And SEMrush brought me on um, a little over a year ago to talk to people about SEO. So I, I love that. It's such a great community to be a part of. And so I'm going to show you guys, um, like I said, a couple of examples of different communities that I've, I've helped build, but I've seen have really nice success. And they all are really different. 
Um, so I've had a hand in all of these uh, these communities. So I am speaking from firsthand experience here too. So first though, we need to talk about the fact that there are different social communities and there's Twitter and video like we're doing today. There's um, Facebook groups, there's LinkedIn communities and your audience could be on any one of those platforms. You just kind of have to find it. Um, recently, SEMrush, we launched a TikTok channel. So your audience could be on TikTok too. The only way to really find that out is to play. So the real life case studies we're going to be looking at today, we're starting with this one. This is actually my uncle. <laughs> he owns his own record store in Catonsville, Maryland, which is just outside of Baltimore, Maryland, on the east coast of the United States. And I am his niece, so I help him with his website and with his social media. So um, he has done a fabulous, fabulous job of creating a community on Facebook in particular. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, his audience is twofold. He has, the, has um, an audience of people who used records in their first time around and are still really in tune to that form of music. And there is a distinctly younger crowd who is reinvig reinvigorating older technology and come and you know finding really great nuances and things of, that are considered retro or vintage and bringing them back to light. So he is his audience is very, very interesting. Um, but they, they have something in common, right? They love music. They appreciate LPs and the quality of music that comes from a record. They are the hunt for something rare. Um, his store is covered wall to floor um, with records that you do need to search for, although you can shop online <laughs> if you prefer that experience. And they love to share their stories about music and musicians and concerts. And that's really where the community is coming together on Facebook. So here are some statistics around his Facebook page. These are the only statistics I will be able to show you today from the other pages, but um, it's really interesting. And I think it shows and demonstrates the power of continual presence and commitment to growing any sort of community. Obviously he, and this is just since March through the end of May when I created the presentation. So, or excuse me, this is February to May as it says on the top of my screen. So just this year, this is how his follower growth um, has accelerated. You can also see in your Facebook analytics, what kind of posts your audience are really engaging with. So for him, it's the photo, photo posts and he gets an average reach of 949. So for a small business, a three they have three employees, a family owned business, he has established a very strong and engaged community and a reach of 949 people might not be um, significant to maybe a brand like Summers, but to him, that is great. For a small business, that is great. With average engagement of 50 to 73, likes and reshares and comments like that is huge so he does a tremendous tremendous job of creating posts and uh it, it, you know creating content that his audience really likes so here are here's some examples of the content that he and i put together for the uh for his audience so real life behind the scenes involvement in the local community. So this was a photo shoot um, for the Baltimore County Tourism. And they're in the record store. Again, you can see like how many actual records are in his store. This is one wall. And how many people are engaged in this post? 1,300 people engaged in just this candid photo of a photographer taking a picture of a model. And, but it really, when you love a store, when you love a brand, like you do really want to see like their success and their progress. And that's why this kind of post works. So another social, uh, another type of post that resonates with his type of community is social commentary and resonating with the experience. And I want you to keep that word in mind as we go through all of these case studies experience. Okay. So here's just a photo of someone holding a vintage button, Is a, but it's a song quote from Bruce Springsteen. And my uncle tweeted or posted on Facebook, hashtag very true, because this quote really just resonated with him. And 2,800 people reacted to this post. And as you saw on the previous screen, he has a follow, he has like 3,000 people following him. So almost everyone reacted to this type of post and content. 
Also, timely memes and jokes are re really resonate with his audience too. We had a really fun time um, with the uh, Bernie Sanders meme back when that happened during the inauguration. And again, like just the incredible reach and reaction um, is just outstanding. This is actually promoting a, a sale that's happening to, in his store this weekend, I think. Um, so it was really fun to put together. So here's a recap of what is working for his content and his community. Keeping in mind, his community is people who had records when they first came around and people who are love the vintage and are bringing it back. People who love music, people who love to share stories. So he doesn't do a lot of salesy posts. He's funny, he's authentic, he is himself, or I am himself when we're posting um, on social media. He has personality. My uncle's a really interesting guy, and people are very drawn to him. You, if you don't, if you that's not you, that's okay. Find someone in your business that is. Also, it's on theme. All of his posts are related to music. So it's definitely diving into that niche. And he is making the most out of his niche. He's posting the behind the scenes. He's making social commentary, but it all revolves around music. But the most important thing that he does is he is consistent. He posts every single day. Okay, so this next real life case study is a really interesting one and very different from my uncle's record store, even though this is also a case study of Facebook. So this is Gold Petal Farms and Gold Petal Farms is a sunflower farm and each fall they create a sunflower maze out of this farm. It's very interesting and sometimes they change locations and they're a great family owned business. Um, if you're ever in Maryland, again, this is a Maryland location, but they, um, are such a great, great atmosphere to be in. So the community of Gold Petal is much different than Tracks on Wax. It's families with young children. It's nature lovers. But Gold Petal also faces the same kind of one end of the spectrum to the other in that they've got these families with children, but they're also very attractive to teens who want great social media pictures. So that is a similarity to Tracks on Wax in that their audiences have a little bit of space in between them as far as segmentation goes. It's also locals because it's a, an, an in-person experience. You can only visit the um, Sunflower Maze in person. and But they also have 14,000 followers on Facebook. That's huge for a small locally owned business. So here's why. Here's some of the examples of the content that they are producing. They're doing branding without selling and building anticipation. So here in the picture is their is a pin it's a metal pin but this is their logo this little bumblebee guy and so it's great they've taken pictures of the flowers in their field as well as put a brand element involved they clearly have professional art direction um the, the god i mean the beauty of the picture on um on facebook is self-explanatory right it's gorgeous it, it encompasses their logos the colors of the sunflowers a lot of artistry it's just fabulously beautiful also, where they get a lot of their strength is their user generated content. They encourage you to take pictures. They encourage you to pose with the flowers. And so here they even hold a photo contest every year. So here they get a lot of engagement. You can see this one had 85 reactions, 14 comments and 12 shares. 12 shares for a locally owned business could be 12 exposures to new eyeballs and new people that are coming into that community. So that is a big deal. They also have professional photography. They actually have a photography or um, a photographer special. You can come in for a certain amount of time and take professional photos as long as we share them on social media. And again, wow, look at the engagement here, 184 reactions. Like this is incredible, incredible engagement for such a small family business with such a niche thing to do. It's a sunflower maze. You don't really get any more niche than that. So what's working from them? And I want you to, and we're gonna talk about the last bullet point the most. Again, we're not salesy. We're not selling anything. We're not selling sunflowers. We announce events, we announce promotions, but there's not a lot of salesy content. It's warm, it's family friendly. The colors are warm, the textures are warm. The photography is warm and it's authentic. They're really embracing the local community, their people, their customers, and they really value that. They're professional yet accessible. So again, inviting these professional photographers is a great way to get amazing photographs, but they really value those user-generated photos too. It's creative and artistic, and that is a 
part of their personality as a business is that creativity and art and artist and artistry. That's, I mean, who makes a maze out of sunflowers? It's beautiful landscaping art. So, you know, it just kind of comes naturally to them as a business. Again, consistency. While the while the mazes are open, they post every single day, multiple times a day to keep that conversation going. Now, the biggest thing they have done for their community on social media is they have translated the in-person experience of being in the sunflowers, in the sunshine, in nature, on to Facebook. How incredible is that? So I just I bring that to point because your social media audience is looking for an experience. They aren't just looking for tips. They aren't just looking for a face. They are looking for engagement with you and they want that tangible experience. Okay, on to SEMrush, who is uh, the company that I work for. So I'm going to be talking about our Twitter community and our LinkedIn community. So overall, the people that are we love to talk to and are involved in SEMrush are digital marketers, just like you, right? But we also talk to a lot of CEOs, a lot of folks right out of college, a very international audience, and those that are just starting out in the digital marketing world. We all had to learn it. We had a great conversation with Sylvia about how she, how long it took her to become so experienced in tech SEO. We can all learn it. We all started from square one. And that's where SEMrush really loves to talk to people too, is if you're just starting out. So, we um what what blah, blah, blah. some examples of the content that we really love and we're really pushing right now are industry conversation starters so here's three different examples of how we start conversations so again we kind of talked about our twitter chat this is one of the questions from our twitter chat you can participate in a twitter chat you can host a twitter chat you can host a Twitter spaces conversation just start, start being the initiator of that conversation we also like to have, we like to like start the reactions. So tell us your industry and we'll tell you the most response or the most expensive related keyword. So that gives you time to to talk to me and me to give something back to you. And then we have a great sense of humor. So we ask the question three words better than I love you. It was the best performing tweet we have had to date. <laughs> so it works. Starting the conversation works. This is my super pro tip, okay? And this is something we absolutely love doing. Interact with brands outside of your industry. You, of course, want to make the industry connections, but expand your horizons. Meet, meet brands at the tone level and not necessarily product or service level. McDonald's is one of those really amazing brands that's funny, timely, current. They, they're doing this, um, this meal with the Korean band BTS. And we engaged with them and it was really, really um, effective. <laughs> and back to this real, this quick, this tweet real quick, the three world words better than I love you. We actually had engagement from a pickle brand. Um, I think Wendy's commented on it. So you just never know what other friends you can make if you don't start the conversation. So reach out, interact with brands that again, are on your same tone level and, and start the conversation there. We are also really on top of search engine optimization news, digital marketing news. We love sharing um, what other brands are doing. Shopify and Google, of course, are great examples of, you know, on the same digital plane as SEMrush, but we love to share what, the, what they're doing, what they're innovating. Um, so, and we love to live tweet events. So this uh, GML 2021 was Google's, um, most recent marketing uh, conference that they did that they streamed live and we live tweeted it so we could have that engagement with our audience and our audience could know what's going on with Google. So we're kind of communicating through osmosis a little bit there too. So what's working for our Twitter community? So a mix of sales and humor. We do post tips. We do post like feature updates because we want our existing customers to stay in tune with what we're doing. But we love our conversation starters to get to a new audience, people who um, just think we're funny and that's okay too. <laughs> but the key there is to always follow up. Don't start a conversation and leave it blindly. Branch out and engaging with brands outside of your industry and staying current with events and sharing the news. That is what social media is about is sharing.
So our LinkedIn community and strategy is slightly different. So here on LinkedIn, we're very educational. We absolutely love to share infographics because this resonates with our digital marketers, step-by-step -step tactics and things that can open their mind and that's how we learn, right? But we're still interactive and fun, um, which is something sometimes that is missing on LinkedIn. So we're doing it. Um, and we love a good funny tweet. And again, it's a conversation starter too, but the tone is still appropriate for LinkedIn. We also engage with other content. We love our influencers. We love our friends on LinkedIn and we have lots of them. So when they do really cool stuff, we like to share it too. So again, make friends, especially on LinkedIn too, and share what they're doing. It's all about you know building others up and creating a tribe for each other. So what's working on LinkedIn for our community? Visuals, visuals, visuals. Our infographics do so well on LinkedIn. It's fantastic. Educational and checklist. Who doesn't love a checklist? I live off of Post-its. There's my whole stack right over here. I love a great checklist. But also that interactivity that sometimes is kind of missing on LinkedIn because it's, LinkedIn can be kind of stale and just educational, but you can create an experience there too by being interactive. And then of course, joining in the conversations with others and being proactive about that conversation and not just waiting around. So the five things I want you to take away today are that different communities need different content and you have to find where your community is and you do that by testing and trying, uh, which was bullet point number two. <laughs> also being consistent, being present, following up and not disappearing is really, really vital. You want to create an experience. It's not just a tweet. It's this person interacting with this person. Create that experience and be present, be yourself, be authentic, be human, be kind, and um, just be there for your community. Okay, so that is me. <laughs> Let me stop. Well, thank you very much. No, you, you can put it back on yours so we know how to contact you, Diana. Okay. Say it one more time. But I can't see you guys, so it's like kind of. Oh, okay. Well, we'll just, oh, there. <laughs> so you can contact uh, Diana at Diana Rich 13 And um, Diana, would you also be able to drop in the chat when is the SEMrush chat? Sorry, I was saying it incorrect, as I know many people do. Sure, yeah. So, so it's on the recording every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern time here in the US is hashtag SEMrush chat. Um, the topic changes every single week. So there's always something new to talk about. It's also a great way to meet other people in the industry. We, there's a lot of friends that have connected through the Twitter chat. Um, and it's a great way to start expressing yourself if you're trying to build your own personal brand. It's a great way to express yourself as an industry um, expert. Even, even if you're new on the field, it's a chance to share your opinions and your experience. So I love it. Great, well, thank you very much. We'll definitely be um, tuning in next week. I think we've sort of run out of time for any questions, but if anybody has any other questions, um, please leave some comments in the chat, or you can also obviously contact Diana on Twitter. And Diana, feel free also to um, put your details in the chat, Sylvia and Heva as well, please. So um, thank you everyone that's joined us so far and that's watching later. I know we sort of timed it, so that's right after lunchtime for the US and as people are finishing work in the UK and Egypt. I also wanted to say, actually, we're a truly international event because um, we're all dialing in from a different country. So I'm dialing from Barcelona, Spain. Uh, Diana, you're dialing in from which city in the U.S.? I'm in San Antonio, Texas in the U.S. Okay. And Sylvia, you're dialing in from where? The audience? Oh, what did from you say, London? Sylvia? I don't know if, yeah, from London, U.K. London. And Heva, where are you dialing in from? Yeah, Alexandria, <laughs> Egypt. So we have um, all dialing in from actually uh, three different continents. So uh, those that are watching today while live, uh, please also drop in where you're calling in from. So I'm going to pass on to our uh, speaker, Heba Saeed, who is going to be talking to us about internal linking and why you cannot afford to ignore it. So. Uh, thank you very much, Sabo. I'll uh, wait for you to share your slides and I'll share them on the screen. Just a minute. Okay. Am I on? You are. Yes, we can see your screen. Thank you. 
I will leave you and we'll come back for Q&A. And for those that are watching, if you've enjoyed the video, please kick a like and subscribe to the channel. Anyone that has signed into um, signed up on SEO Joe Blogs, you will get email with all the links to the presentations and the video. Thank you very so, much. Thank you, Joe, for inviting me. I'm really excited today. Um, I'm Heba Said. I have a, an SEO experience for six years now. Uh, it all started by coincidence, like everyone else in the industry, I guess. Uh, I worked in an agency and in-house, but right now I'm freelancing and enjoying working from home, as everyone from COVID. Uh, I love reading, snorkeling, and diving, uh, and I love drinking coffee. So um, let me get started. Today I'm going to talk about internal linking and why it is very important and underestimated, actually. Uh, and you can't afford to ignore it in your SEO strategy. So my discussion will go through what are internal links, why internal links important for SEO, uh, and then the internal links types, and how to audit internal links, and then a real life example of success. So what are internal links? Internal links are uh, in linking from page A to page B on the same domain. So this is how the code looks like. And you need to check your codes because sometimes uh, you're going to use HTML uh, during your SEO. So you need to know that any link tag contain a URL and an anchor text. This anchor text is the keyword that I use for my internal linking strategy. So why internal links are very important for my SEO plan? According to Databox survey, they said that about 98% said internal linking efforts made a positive impact for their SEO. So internal links is important for search engine as search engine will always crawl your site, but sometimes they need to have internal link structure within your website to get to new pages that you launch. Google understand the hierarchy and value of your content from these internal links. So as Google said here, some pages are known because Google has already crawled them before, but other pages are discovered when Google follows a link from a known page to a new page. It also improves the user experience and navigation. Nothing is more important than making my life, my user's life easier. So they can have more time on page and less bounce rate. That means better user experience and ranking. So pro tip here to aim to increase your, your client revenue, because your client doesn't care much about the traffic as long as it's getting more revenue. So you need to point your user to their purchase funnel through internal linking. Passing page authority is passing authority from a page that you got high external links to another page that go lower external links. Here I have page A got 10 external links from an authority website. So this, this page is like having a higher authority than my other page. I link them together so they can pass authority to each other. Types of internal links. We have navigational, contextual, and others. Navigation internal links is the navigation, the main navigation structure of your website. It can be as main menu, a footer or sidebars. So this is how it should look like. You have a home page, and this home page is having a page one, page B, and then sub page for each one. Contextual internal linking. They are the link that got anchor text that are placed within the body content of any page of your website. They must be relevant to your content, and it's 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 a pro tip to use a long tail keyword. Don't just use your keyword. They should sound natural and deliver value to your content. So don't push it. Adding contextual links into the, uh, the page, got high authority and high traffic will benefit other pages. So here I used a page from my client and I linked to other pages that I were not ranking at the moment. Other kind of internal links, you can always add internal links for an image as a source link under the image or jump links within the content. If you have a content, a very long content, you can always add anchor links 
uh, that points to other content within the same page. So it, if you click, it takes you to the different part of the same page and it shows search engine. Uh, this, uh, it shows in the search engine result page as site links if it's relevant to user's query. So this is how I used it in a blog post. I added these anchor text and they jumped and they appeared in the search engine as site links. This increased my return, uh, my click in through. So people clicking more if they didn't find what they need in, from the description, they just jump into what they need. How to audit your website internal links. There are many tools that you can crawl your website like SimRush, Moz, Ares, and Screaming Frog. Screaming Frog got this visual visualization and tree graph is always cool to find strong pages and orphan pages. Orphan pages are pages that don't have any internal links in your website. So you need to focus on that. This is how it looks like if you use the crawl tree graph of the Screaming Frog. You got the home page and then depths to number one and two and so on. So here you can always follow where your pages are linking from and to. And this is cool because you can always zoom in and find and focus in, uh, on a certain page and how it's linking together. All, all uh, the red ones always means that they are orphan pages. How to edit your site internal links using Google Search Console. It's easy. You can go to links and internal links and then export. But Google Search Console only gives you the, the, the number of the um, internal links that each page got. I will use ARF in my example. First, I need to determine my main keyword and the pages the client wants to rank for. Then find the page pages of my site and build an internal link strategy to rank. I collected my main keyword. This is an example. Sorry for the noise. Uh, and, th and then my keyword were neither ranking nor ranking with the right pages. They got cannibalization issues too. So first go to the sidebar and get the best link, a pass by link, and then click the internal. You will find each page got these do follow internal links. And then I will do my keyword research. You need to make a keyword list for each page. I call them main pages or hub pages to help you with your anchor text and then create a topic cluster around these pages. You can get ideas of keywords that are relevant to your content using ARF or any other tool or using the one and only Google Search Console performance report. So by using Google Search Console, you can check the performance report and hub pages see the queries and long and point for the long tail keywords that users are searching for that got high impression and are very relevant to your content but got zero clicks or using ARFs, analyze your main page and get to the organic keywords then the magic become you can see all the keywords that you are ranking for organically so why don't you use those to boost my ranking a little bit I created a sheet with all my keywords that I can use as an anchor text. But here I need to, I need to analyze more and see each keyword that should main, should aim to one page. I don't want to repeat my client, my client previous issue and create a cannibalization a issue through pointing one keyword to more than one page. I know my client main keywords and pages. In my example, they are the services pages. I did my keyword research, and now I have a plan to work on. First, I added the services pages in the footer of the site. So this is how my website footer looked before. And then I added this, other services. I didn't find any navigational uh, links for this services page before. So this is how I created this footer uh, menu. They changed the uh, out, out, out interface, so that's why it looks so different. Now, adding uh, adding contextual links, linking from your best link page. First, I went through ARFs and got my best by links or external. 
I checked the pages of the highest referring domain and I added an internal link for another service page if it is relevant and should add value to my content. I shouldn't always push it. I shouldn't push it at all. Example of using different anchor text here. This is the same service page, but I used two different inter, uh, anchor text. They point to the same page. Creating a topic cluster. This is a third point. So now that I have a main idea, uh, I wanted to create a topic cluster. Having a pillar content, which is writing a content about a broad topic. I didn't have a pillar content. I had a services pages. I then building other content to discuss specific topic from the pillar content. These are called topic clusters. We can link it with the pillar content and vice versa. So here is HubSpot explaining it. You have a pillar content, which is in the middle, and then you surround it with topics that are topic clusters. Another illustration here is, here is the home page, surface pages, and this is my blog. So I use my services pages as a pillar content, and then I created a blog discussing the topics, different kind of topics that serve the services pages, and I link them together. I made a content plan, and I started to create content, where, and I redirected to topics. Topics here are my pillar pages. So each content is serving a page. Linking from old blog posts to new and vice versa. People always forget to link back. They can link from a new one to old one, but they never go back to old ones and link it to the new. And this is a huge mistake because Google needs to know that you're passing this from here to there. So something like this, I always add in my blog post uh, to link to another blog post that is relevant to my content. This is my example for the services page number one. Before they had 212 internal links and they were not ranking in the top 50. After I worked through footer and contextual linking and cluster topics, they are now ranking number three. So from rank number 76 to number three, just by adding some internal links and anchor text. And there were increased by 775 in the organic session for this page. Example number two, I had this page that were not ranking at all because it was cannibalized, actually. It was ranking in a totally different page. It, was, it didn't have any internal links at all, and it didn't rank in the top 100. After, it, was, it, it became number five. So this is my true tip. Always wrong targeted pages is easily fixed by adding an internal linking strategy to let search engine know the correct page for a certain anchor text or topic. So this is how it looks like after fixing this wrong page from zero ranking to number five. Pillar pages performance increased by 540 after this strategy. The whole website performance after adding this strategy increased by 1000%. Remember, I added a lot of topics cluster that perform these services pages. So this is how this became from 7,000 session per month to 78,000 uh, session per month. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heba. That was great. Um, try this. <laughs> yeah, you are. How can people get hold of you? How can they get get hold of you and have a side um, SEO? Uh, I forgot to add my um, my intro, my LinkedIn profile. I will add it in the chat. Yes, please. Um, yeah, that was great. Sorry, I was just um, analyzing your results, and then I was slow to switch us back in. So we have uh, one question from Aswara. Uh, do jump links automatically appear on SERP results? Yes, it actually does. I tested that before with many blog posts, and they uh, always appear not in 
in all the queries, but mostly yeah. they appear. Google That's is great. doing very well with FAQs as well. So FAQs and site links are very good for for the clicking through. I, I love yeah. it. How long <laughs> I did love it take? With these. <laughs> Just how long did it take from when you added that jump link to seeing that in the search results? Um, not much. A couple of days actually when they got indexed again. Oh wow, that's great. And some impressive results that you were talking about with those pages. Over what time period was that? Um, 2017 until 2020, but some pages I added the um, the result for one year. Okay, but just in terms of um, the let's say the performance result, it's quite two years. Yes. <laughs> but just in terms of the um, the ranking results, obviously, yes, I yeah, the the overall is very impressive. But how long did yeah. it take you to see that change From in ranking? Three months to six months. Yes, okay. it's, I always give myself a three months to see my results if I'm testing something. Sometimes it show up in a, a second and sometimes it takes some time. This is SEO, so yeah, we need to wait for Google to update as well. <laughs> yeah, but well, that's still very good. And um, was this your site or um, sort of a client site that you're working on? It's a client site. Oh, wow. So such a big, such impressive results. And you didn't do anything else apart from this internal linking. Yes, of course. Yeah, the um, actually it was the topic cluster that made this huge um, traffic because people wanted to know about the services more than the services. I he was working with visual mailboxes, so um, okay. as Heba, I didn't know what's visual mailboxes. So this is how I started. People need to know more about your services to get to your service. Uh, okay, you, which you, mean, you mean virtual mailboxes, like they're just gonna have, it looks like I'm in this country or city, but I'm not really, you mean? Yes, you have a virtual address and then yes. you get emails for it. Great, um, we have another question. What happens if there's more than one link pointing to the same internal link from one page? Okay. Uh, it's a mess, actually. This is how uh, I started saying that cannibalization is very yeah. wrong. You need to focus in one keyword for each page. You can't work um, the same keyword in two pages. This confuses search engine and the user, so you can't rank with them. Yeah, exactly. And so that's why you have the topics, because you have like a, basically a broad topic, and you can mm -hmm. link on that topic. But obviously, within the individual articles, or within the individual pages, you can, of course, ex go into detail of that topic. I think sometimes people get a bit obsessed with specific exact match terms, but I think the word yes. topic, like you said, yes. the topic I, cluster I, Actually, it was my mistake at first. I tried that. I tried to put my anchor text all the same keyword, and it didn't do well. So this is when I started to think, this is so spammy. <laughs> I need to work for more anchor text. Uh, and that's how I got the idea of creating a list of keywords so I can't like go through it again. Um, and whenever I need an anchor text, I go through my sheet, take a peek and then, okay, we can use this word, we can use that word and so on. Great, so to confirm really, it was like the key topics that you agreed on and you were ranking for those key topics, but you yes. used similar obviously or child, ch child keywords of that topic to help yes. you. I used uh, the long queries as topics as well and QAs. I found a lot of keywords that I can use as a content. So I said, why don't we do a content about this and then link back to the service page to post it and so on. Great, well, thank you very much. Does anybody else have any other questions? Well, I just want to say a big thank you very much to Heba, Sylvia, and Diana for being with us today on our Turn Digi event. Thank you our for having us. Yeah, it was great. It's a truly international event. Uh, I think some of you have joined today as well, saw the chat saying, um, looking for more speakers. We'll probably put one on in September, um, looking to maybe do a Spanish version in July, but we'll wait and see how that goes. I just thought wanted to say um, so big thank you to my sister Ruth. Um, she did the artwork for Turnjiji and Tea Time SEO Authorities. Um, and this is just uh, yeah, thank you to Ruth. That was us actually a few years ago. Now she's in Australia, so um, maybe when they open the borders, we'll uh, see her soon. <laughs> so um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today at Turnjiji. If for those that 
are joining us later, uh, please uh, click the like button and subscribe if you've obviously enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, uh, feel free to also put in your, in the chat as Heather's doing, your uh, LinkedIn uh, details. And Diana has said that the next SEM, sorry, SEMrush, sorry, Anton will not be happy with me, SEMrush chat is on Wednesday at 11 a.m. EST time. So that would be um, 4 p.m. UK time, 5 p.m. European time and Egypt time. And it would be uh, quite a bit late in Australia then. <laughs> so, um, however, did you want to put in yours? Are you putting your LinkedIn profile as well into the chat? Yeah, okay, great. And if anybody would like to get involved, uh, some of you have already joined and have been in contact with me, that's great. Others that would like to just contact me on um, on SEO Good Blogs on Thank Twitter. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming on the show today and sharing your um, sharing your tips. For those that have registered on uh, SEO Joe Blogs, you will get a email via HubSpot with a link to the slides and also to this uh, video. So. Uh, Thank you very much. I think uh, your chat might just be coming in, Heba, for your LinkedIn. I don't know, does it look on your end? Mm, no. It didn't appear? Didn't appear yet, otherwise I can, I can put it on really quickly. And if anyone has any other questions for our speakers, please also connect with them on on Facebook, sorry, not on Facebook, on um, LinkedIn and also or and on Twitter and they then they can respond to you there. So I'll just put your on Twitter, on uh, LinkedIn. I cannot multitask and say it incorrectly. Mm. But it should be, it is there now in the, the big chat. Thank you. Oh, I think because it went in private chat. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And if you've enjoyed the, the show today, uh, click a like and uh, subscribe to our channel. And we'll see you for more Turnigy uh, details to be confirmed, confirmed very soon. See you later. See you. Bye-bye.